Hello everybody and welcome back to the second shelf and to another Tops and Flops. Yes, the July is way, way behind us and I am late, I know, because it's already the 6th of August, uh, but um, better late than never um, uh, to talk to you about my Tops and Flops reads of the month of July. Um, and as always, we start with the tops. And as always, within the tops, we start with the book that I thought about the most. And that book is um, a 2020 release uh, by Kate Elizabeth Russell, My Dark Vanessa. Mm, I read this book for the Booktube Prize, uh, my ranking of the fiction group that I uh, rank for the semifinals will be up uh, day after tomorrow on Sunday, so, but uh, th this is also, has also be, make a whole sentence. Just breathe and then make a whole sentence. This book I also wanted to include in the tops and flops. Um, it's a debut novel. Um, uh, the author is um, was born in 1984. Uh, uh, she lives in Maine. And the protagonist in the book, uh, it's split in two timelines. I mean, not the protagonist is not split into two timelines. The book is split into two timelines, 2000 um, and 2017. And in 2000, the protagonist, Vanessa, is 15 years old. So she is the same age as um, uh, the author. I don't know whether this is uh, autobiographical. It doesn't really matter. Uh, Vanessa is... Um, uh, 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 an intelligent but also shy and insecure girl and uh, she falls in her view she falls head over heels in love with her English teacher who is almost 30 years older he's 42 43 uh, and they start a relationship and she uh, it goes on through her college years and then you know they split up she goes to uh, her high school year sorry she goes to college but she keeps in touch and then in 2017, not surprisingly, 2017 is the Me Too year. Um, um, there are uh, 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 accusations of abuse done by that same teacher. And that means that Vanessa starts to re-examine her past. Was it really, quote unquote, love or was it more a question of grooming by the teacher and abuse of her? Um, and I find this book really thought-provoking uh, because it tries to tackle um, an issue that is quite nuanced. Uh, you have the, uh, you know, the straightforward abuse where both uh, parties know that it's abuse. The perpetrator knows it's abuse anyway, uh, but also the victim. But in this case, you have this more complex situation that this teenage girl, when she was 15, she believed that it was love. She loved the teacher and the teacher loved her. And I thought that this was um, thought provoking and very well done. For me, I, I saw reviews in Goodreads that it was uh, not well written and and cliched. I didn't. Uh, it didn't come across for me as such. It, it's a debut novel, yes, and I'm always a little more lenient when it's a debut. But I really thought it was an important topic um, and a different angle to an important topic, and that's why it's the book that I thought about the most um, in July. The next book in the tops is the book that surprised me the most. Um, and one of you viewers, subscribers, will really laugh very hard now because uh, in my last Friday reads, I also featured a YA book that I read for the Reading Women Challenge 2021 because one of the prompts is a read a YA book by a Latinx author, if I remember correctly. And one of you commented, what is next? You promoting a book in the tops and flops with a child narrator? That's exactly what happens right now, because the book that surprised me the most is a short story collection by Tony Kate uh, Bambera, Gorilla, My Love, first published in 1972. 
Um, this was my first book by Tony Kate Bombera. I have to admit, hanging my head in shame, I had never heard of this author before. Um, uh, and Sean from Sean the Book Maniac suggested this book as a buddy read. And I'm really, really grateful uh, that he did. Um, it's, like I said, a short story collection and it's about 10 stories and 99% of the stories is a child narrator. And you know me as the one who made the comment and knows me. That is not my thing at all. But it worked here and I think it did because it was, it, it was short stories. Um, I realized that I can obviously handle um, a, a child narrator without it grading me if it's not a long form uh, fiction. So in short stories, uh, it's fine. And um, they are not all excellent. As always in a short story collection, there are some that didn't quite work, at least for me. Uh, but most of them with a really... Uh, you know, sassy, uh, uh, very well aware of the surroundings, young um, black girls as protagonists, I thought they were really good. Um, they are all set in the, the book is published 1972, so they are all set in the 1960s, uh, but it didn't feel uh, like historical fiction or anything. It was giving um, a, a slice of life, <laughs> as uh, one of my good friends, uh, formerly booktuber Adam, used to say when we read short stories. And that's exactly what this book did. And because the child uh, narrator was so prevalent, it surprised me a lot. But it was still very, very good. And as always, uh, the last um, category in the tops is the best nonfiction book. And I will have two. So. We will have a premiere uh, because, first of all, two. And second of all, I will break uh, my own rule with the second one. But we will get to that in a minute. Uh, the first one is um, a memoir, um, The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating by Elizabeth Tova Bailey, uh, published uh, more than 10 years ago, to, uh, 2010. And I had never heard of this book, but uh, Kim from Middle of the Book March, uh, she raved about it. And I thought that sounded so interesting. So I bought it for myself um, and I read it and I really really enjoyed it. Um, it's um, the, the the memoir about uh, Bailey being ill, uh, bedridden for quite a while uh, and um, she can't move a lot so she is really bedridden, can't do much um, and one of her friends brings her a plant uh, with a tiny wild snail on it. Um, and then there is a, a, a terrarium built for the snail, you know. But the, the, the book is about Elizabeth Bailey watching the snail and learning about snails. And boy, did I not know how fascinating uh, uh, snails can be and what kind of fascinating creatures they are. So I learned a lot about snails, but also it's a book about patience, of course, because a snail um, is not a fast animal. Um, it's not uh, focusing that much on the illness. Uh, we learn a little bit about it. And I know that some um, uh, people who read the book I talked with, they have doubts whether uh, the author was actually ill or whether she's just, you know, making it all up. I don't care. Uh, the the she felt ill. She was in bed, and she watched the snake. Uh, snake. She watched the snail, and that's what accounted for me. And I thought it was a delightful um, and interesting uh, read, and I can highly, highly recommend it. And then for um, the breaking of the rules, because this is a male author. Ooh, and we normally don't do this here on this channel. Uh, but this book, Walter Isaacson, The Code Breaker, is first of all such a brilliant book. It was published earlier this year and it features um, a, a female scientist, uh, Jennifer Doudna, um, also her colleague, her French colleague, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, and they both uh, uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2020. Uh, and this book is about their research. Uh, it's the, the, the 
technique that they developed called CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R, -R, all uh, um, um, capital letters, uh, which is a technique that you can use to uh, edit genes very precisely. If you are at all interested in science, it also deals with the coronavirus and the implications um, that this new research has for vaccines. It tells us about gene editing and it tells us about Jennifer Doudna's life. Uh, she is a fascinating woman. Uh, Walter Isaacson does a fantastic job of describing her research for non-scientists to understand without it being dry um, he doesn't sugarcoat um, his heroine, Jennifer Doudna. She is a complicated um, a woman, like we all are. And we learn about all the other people in the field and the competition um, between um, those various researchers in order to find this gene editing tool and make it work. It's absolutely fascinating and it was worth, for me, breaking the rule of only featuring female authors. But we are not going to make a habit out of it, I can tell you. Oh, and I completely forgot uh, to mention that um, the code breaker, because I'm so nervous about breaking my own rules now, um, but I read the code breaker as a buddy read with Heidi from my reading life. Um, and she is a scientist, so she can judge the book even better than I can, and she loved it as well. And I think she already made, um, um, uh, she already reviewed the book. I will see whether I can find the review and link it uh, down below. So these were my four <laughs> top reads of the month of July, on to the flops. Um, and the first one is a novel that I also read for the Booktube Prize, um, and that is Emma Donahue's The Pull of the Stars, published in 2020. Um, Emma Donoghue is an Irish uh, writer from Dublin, and of course, most of you, if you know her, you will know her from uh, one of her previous books, Room. I didn't like that book at all. I was one of the few, so I was, I'm not an Emma Donoghue fan. But this, nevertheless, I mean, despite the fact that I had to read it because it was for the Booktube Prize, I would have picked it up anyway, um, because it's historical fiction set in a time, 1918, um, uh, in Dublin, um, but the time period is of specific interest to me. Um, and also the topic, because it's not about so much about the First World War, but about the influenza epidemic that which happened during that time period. And uh, if you follow my channel uh, for a little while, you will know that uh, in 2019, at the end of the year, I read quite some books, non-fiction books mainly, um, about the uh, influenza uh, epidemic, uh, which is kind of a blueprint for pandemics. And we obviously didn't learn anything if you look at what happened then and what's happening now with the corona pandemic, but just aside. So I was really interested, but the book didn't work for me. Uh, we follow a nurse, Julia Power, who is working in a very small maternity uh, uh, ward of the hospital where women um, who are about to give birth, uh, but they also have the flu, influenza. And then there are some other characters coming in, uh, one of which is an actual a historical figure. And that was all sounded interesting, but I couldn't handle the writing. It is, um, um, yeah, how can I put this? Uh, let me see whether I can find a page that you can easily see it. Yeah, it's, it's all one line paragraphs, most of the book, you know, and this is not a dialogue, it's exposition dialogue. That doesn't work for me. It is kind of a Twitter feel, you know, one sentence uh, a par uh, paragraph, one sentence, paragraph, one sentence, paragraph. I didn't find the, um, it, I didn't find it engaging. I find it boring a lot of times. It was like she, um, uh, we, uh, we learn a lot about, you know, um, what it was like giving birth back then in the, you know, early 20th century, 1918, but it sounded as if she copy pasted this from a um, how to give birth in 1918 uh, 
kind of leaflet. It just didn't work for me at all. I was not engaged. I was really bored. Uh, and the writing style um, graded on me after 20, 30 pages. So unfortunately, this book didn't work for me. And the second book in um, the flops was a work of translated fiction, uh, Kanea Kanai Minato Confessions, translated from the Japanese by Stephen Snyder, uh, published in Japan in 2000, and again, I have to look that up, I'm sorry, 2008, yes, and the translation in 2014. And I picked this book up, I saw it somewhere, I don't remember, but I picked it up because, again, of the Reading Women Challenge 2021, because um, one of the prompts, prompt number 10, if I remember correctly, is read a crime uh, a fiction, a mystery, a thriller in translation. And this obviously qualifies. Um, it's a debut novel. Uh, uh, Minato is a best-selling author in, in Japan now. This was her debut, her first uh, thriller. Um, and it is um, confessions because it is about um, a high school teacher, female high school teacher, um, whose daughter um, died in an accident. That's how we learn it in the beginning, a drowning in a pool. Uh, the daughter is, I don't know, five or six or so something. Um, and uh, then we learn what really happened, and the teacher accuses people, you know, of being involved in the death, and we get various uh, multiple points of views. It starts with the teacher, but we also get the people involved, uh, so other uh, students in that uh, class that she teaches, a friend of hers, we get multiple perspectives and it's like a puzzle. In the end, we will we know what happens. Um, the uh, book centers around the teacher uh, initiating a revenge plot for the people he, uh, she thinks are responsible for the death of her uh, daughter. That's the main, uh, uh, let's say, the main plot device uh, throughout the book because we learn rather early on who she thinks um, the culprits are, but then the the revenge plot is the actual plot. Um, and that sounds all fine, but I had issues, uh, really severe issues with the revenge plot in terms of, and please beware, it's now four, three, two, one, spoilers. I can't couldn't really do it with Anne, but there will be spoilers now. Um, and the revenge plot involves uh, effect infecting uh, people with the HIV uh, virus. I don't like that at all. This idea, you know, of um, HIV, uh, uh, people who have HIV as a weapon, that's a very, for me, politically dubious um, point of view, but okay. But the main issue was then that this book, published in 2008, I mean, 21st century, and not the start, but 21st century, uh, HIV AIDS is not a deadly uh, disease anymore, uh, at least not in a Western country. There is therapy uh, so that you can't even uh, uh, trans uh, transfer transmit transmit the HIV virus if you are infected, even with unprotected sex because your uh, viral count is so low. And it's not a death sentence. It has been in the 1980s and 1990s before good therapy was available, but it isn't anymore in 2008. And the fact that she obviously has stopped looking at you know the developments in HIV uh, and AIDS uh, treatments after the 1990s and just tells us that it's a deadly uh, disease. Also confusing HIV and AIDS all the time as if it's like if you have HIV you develop AIDS that's two different things. Yeah it was really badly researched and that irked me uh, I had a lot of friends who died uh, from AIDS in the 1990s when there was no treatment available. 
And I have a lot of friends now who are infected with HIV and who are uh, in therapy or have therapy and they live uh, an almost uh, uh, normal life and they have almost normal life expectancy. So it really, really irked me. Yes. Sorry about that. Anyway, these were my tops and flops for the month of July. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. As always, I'm looking forward to your comments and I'll see you all soon in the next one.